Hello. I'm Larry Wessels. I'm the director of Day Spring Evangelism. It's an uh, evangelical organization that reaches out to people uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we offer all kinds of information, tracks, cassette tapes, books, and other assorted items. Uh, we, we do this all freely. Uh, we have different tracks. I've got a few here as examples. Uh, you know, tracks on who Jesus is, scriptural uh, verses to look up, quick, easy readings for fast reference. Uh, we have in, uh, detailed tracks that take you into all kinds of subject areas uh, on many topics. Uh, whether you have someone that's involved in, let's say, a, a religion, or maybe one of your relatives has got into some strange religious group or or cult or something like that, and they come around trying to convert you to their faith, or you've lost a son or a daughter to something like this, or you simply have friends or other people you'd like to talk to about it. We have tracks on all these different uh, religions dealing with different topics and ideas. This this track here, perhaps, uh, uh, besides, uh, well, actually, this track here does, uh, deals with Jehovah's Witnesses, and this one here uh, deals with uh, reincarnation. Uh, we have things on creation science, refuting evolution, little tracks and books and other things. Uh, we uh, offer all these things, cassette tapes on almost any kind of subject uh, uh, you may care to ask about. All these things are available at Dayspring Evangelism, the post office box, 43331, Austin, Texas. Uh, 78745 and uh, we'll be glad to supply you with uh, free information we don't want any money you don't have you, there's no money being asked for here you just drop us a note or give us a phone call and leave a message on the answer machine or something and we'll try to get you the information you need uh, it's just an evangelical outreach to the community uh, I'm here uh, representing uh, Day Spring uh, Fellowship, that's our church, it's a little independent uh, Baptist church here in Austin, uh, and pastored by a uh, man of God, Jackson Boyette, and uh, you may have seen uh, some of his shows on television, but uh, that gives you a little background where we're coming from. Uh, basically, we're not so much interested in denominations here, we're simply interested in uh, scriptural uh, evidence for who Jesus is, what the nature of God is, uh, did he raise from the dead, did he resurrect from the dead, Jesus Christ. Uh, key doctrines such as this, they're very important because they relate to the salvation and de eternal destiny of the soul. Uh, and the reason I can say that is because Jesus said it. And uh, so we will look in the scriptures uh, and see what they have to say. The Bible, the Word of God, something that... Uh, stands uh, on based on ge geological evidence. I mean, the cities mentioned in the Bible are real cities. People mentioned in the Bible are historical figures. You can confirm these people, St. Paul, Jesus, uh, Pontius Pilate, whoever, by other means, other history books and things like this. These are real people. These aren't myths mentioned here. Uh, the Bible is reliable. It's got over 10,000 manuscripts dating back to the first century. So we know that we have you know, for almost uh, almost 100 percent here of exactly what they had back when the church first started 2,000 years ago. Uh, the prophecies mentioned in the Bible are out incredible. Uh, Prophecies that tell of the coming of Christ, prophecies that tell of the last days, the second coming of Christ. There's even a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, that gives you the specific, the specific date that Jesus Christ will come and die for the sins of the people. Uh, in the Psalms, it talks about how he'll be crucified. And, and uh, in other passages, I think it's in Zechariah, it talks about how he'll be sold for 30 pieces of silver. There are just outstanding prophecies that as you start to look at these prophecies they become almost 
to the supernatural, where there is just no way by accident or chance that all these prophecies could have been fulfilled in one man. And there's, these, of course, are messianic prophecies dealing with the coming of Christ. And then there's other prophecies dealing with the future of cities, nations, and world events. Uh, now that's a different topic, and if you have questions about that, feel free to write Day Spring Evangelism for information on Bible prophecy. But uh, today we're here to talk about the nature of God, who Jesus is, and uh, uh, particularly the resurrection of Christ. So what I'd like to do now is take a look here in the Gospels. We'll look at uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 28. And I'd like to establish right off the bat uh, something about who Jesus is and what he accomplished. Uh, a lot of people uh, have said that Jesus is is uh, a good man, he, uh, or either he was just an idea somebody had, or Jesus was just a prophet, like the Muslims say. Uh, the, the Mormons say Jesus was uh, born uh, after a sexual union between Adam, God, and uh, Mary. Uh, uh, that sounds pretty bad, but if you don't believe me, uh, that's was spoken by Brigham Young in uh, Journal Discourses, Volume 1, I think page 50, and other references. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus is just a created being, the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God, and that Jesus is uh, the Archangel Michael, and then God uh, turned him into Jesus the man, and then Jesus the man died and ceased to exist, and then God recreated Jesus into Michael the Archangel again. These are some ideas that different religious systems have and uh, there are many more believe me take a hundred people off the street and they'll give you a hundred different answers as to who Jesus is and uh, what we want to do is look at what the Bible says about Jesus about the nature of God and about his resurrection because these things uh, are important to the destiny of the soul the eternal destiny I may say according to the Word of God the scriptures and if these scriptures aren't true, then Jesus is not true because Jesus constantly affirmed the scriptures. The Old Testament constantly quoted the Old Testament prophets throughout and said the word of God was true. The apostles said the same thing in the New Testament. And if uh, you can't trust the Bible for your information, then you might as well not believe Jesus. He was just a liar or a lunatic. Uh, the apostles all died for no reason at all. They got themselves crucified and killed and executed for a big lie. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe they'd all die like that for what they knew was a lie. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, I, I want to just reemphasize the importance of the Word of God. And uh, if you're watching today and you're an atheist or a skeptic and you just don't think there's anything uh, to the Bible, uh, feel free to drop us a, a note saying you'd like some information on maybe some evidence for the Bible. I mean, you may still reject the information, but uh, at least you'll you'll have that to to check for yourself uh, someone once said that uh, there's enough evidence uh, for the Word of God that if you're open-minded you you will be thoroughly convinced in its validity and truth but if you're thoroughly against believing the Bible then there's not enough evidence in the world to believe in it so you know you'll have to uh, decide for yourself how you want to base that but we're going to look at an ex a biblical exposition of who Jesus is and the nature of God in the resurrection so looking at John chapter 20 verse 28 and uh, in fact that's the key verse but like I always seem to do <laughs> I look in context and I'd like to start a verse or two ahead of that uh, and I will I'll start in verse 26 and uh, I'll start in verse 25 and move down the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. This is Thomas not believing that Jesus had raised from the dead. This is after the resurrection of Christ. This is after he's... He's already risen, and the other disciples are saying, well, we've seen him, and Thomas will not believe unless he sees the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the, of the nails and thrust my hand to the side, as he said. Oh, and one brief point here on verse 25. 
Uh, now, some religions and cults teach that like Jesus was not crucified on a cross, but he was crucified on like a torture stake. And uh, the torture stake entailed having one nail through uh, both hands and one nail through the feet on the bottom. Uh, but uh, as we see here from this verse, uh, when he says, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, plural, put my finger into the print of the nails, plural, uh, that there was two nails instead of one in the hands, which would then refute this idea of a torture stake or, or something other than a cross, which was a, the traditional way of Ro Roman crucifixion at the time of Christ. Anyway, going on now. Getting back on, on track, verse 26, And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said, saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. And of course in the Greek it says, Ho kurios and ho theos. The Lord and the God. Uh, we, in the Greek it, it is very, very specific. Uh, Thomas is calling Jesus directly and applying the divine name to him. My Lord and my God. So we see something here. We see two things. We see that Jesus is called God by Thomas, who at that, up until that point had been unbelieving and faithless. And we also see that Jesus has risen from the dead, and he still in his body has the nail prints in his hand and uh, in his feet and, and the, uh, the uh, thrust in his side from the spear. So uh, we're seeing a resurrected body, Jesus appearing to Thomas, and in Thomas ad admitting as to who Jesus is, Jesus is the Lord, and he's God. Now, with that in mind, I'd like to uh, go to another passage. Uh, as long as I'm here, I'm kind of touching on two things at once. I'm, talking, I'm touching on uh, uh, the resurrection and the deity of Christ. Deity, of course, meaning... God, Jesus being God, God in the flesh, as we've, uh, uh, as as John chapter one verse one, uh, in the beginning was the Word, Word was with God, and the Word was God, and John one fourteen it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We see that Jesus is called God, and uh, there's numerous other passages that prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt. Uh, in fact. Uh, as we've we've seen, the, the Jews wanted Jesus crucified because he had claimed to uh, be the Christ and the Son of God, making himself equal with God. You'll find these passages like in Mark 14, Mark chapter 14, verse 61 through 65, and uh, in John chapter 5, uh, verses uh, 17 and 18, I think it is. Uh, you'll find that uh, the Jews knew that he was calling himself, making himself equal with God. And they tried to kill him. Uh, also, we find in John chapter 5, verse 23, the verse says there, Honor the Son as you honor the Father. Jesus gets the same uh, honor as the Father does. Uh, in other passages, uh, we, we, we find that Jesus is... is uh, calling himself by the divine name of the I Am. In John 8, 58, he says, Before Abraham came into being, I Am. I Am coming from Exodus 3, 14, uh, the Old Testament, where Moses was asking God himself what his name was so he could go tell the Israelites what that name was. And God told him, Tell them, I Am. So Jesus applied the divine name to himself in John 8:58. And the Jews immediately tried to kill him in verse 59 after that. And we've, uh, in John 8, 24, in that same chapter, Jesus said, You must believe that I am the eternal one. In the Hebrew, which is where the I am comes from, it literally means the eternal one who always was, always will be, and always has been. Uh, he was using, he said, unless you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. So it's critically important that we believe that Jesus is the I Am, the eternal God. Now, just to buttress that a little bit more, uh, I'll, I'll quote a few more passages 
supporting that. And then I want to get into the resurrection, which will also support that Jesus is God in the flesh, second person of the Trinity. And, of course, the third thing I want to talk about is the Trinity itself. Most people have a vague concept of the Trinity. And, like, to Jehovah's Witnesses, it's like saying blood to an Englishman. It's a, it's a concept that's been attacked by numerous religions. In fact, uh, I don't want to be considered as a hateful person that, that downgrades other people in their face, but uh, I'm simply here trying to defend the historic Christian doctrines as brought forth by the scriptures. And when these other religions attack what the, what the, the Bible teaches, such as who Jesus is as far as he is being God and when they don't believe that the Holy Spirit is God and when they deny the Trinity and they deny that Jesus rose physically from the dead uh, and they deny these things and they attack them vigorously in their own religious system then I have to come as a Christian witness and say no this is what Christianity stands for and we're going to defend against these people that come and try to attack our faith so I have nothing against Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, uh, Christian scientists, uh, Unity School people, uh, and so forth. Uh, those people are uh, sincere, loving, and kind people. And I, I love them in the Lord. But uh, as it says in the scriptures, the truth has to come out. The truth has to be told. And hopefully, if you follow along with me and we go through these scriptures, You'll find out that I'm telling the truth, hopefully. Uh, if not, you'll find that out, too. Uh, but uh, the Scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, uh, uh, Test all things, hold fast to that which is true. Okay, so uh, I want to look over at Titus chapter 2, verse 13. And we'll just look at a few more verses here, and I'll give you a... Like I said, anyone can write to this ministry and ask for scripture verses that show the Trinity, show Jesus is God, show the Holy Spirit is God, and so forth. And we will be glad to supply them with all the verses they'd like to do in their own personal biblical research. But I'm just going to touch on the surface of just all the vast array of verses. Now, I know like a lot of these religious groups, they come up with verses that say, well, Jesus couldn't be God because he doesn't know who touched him. He doesn't know when he'd come back and, and all these things. And as... Uh, I've said in a previous special broadcast that we we produced uh, in in Philippians chapter two. If you have time to read that sometime, uh, starting in verse uh, five or six, I believe, and reading on through the rest of that chapter, you'll find that Jesus is complete God and complete man. He's the God man. He's a hundred percent God. He's a hundred percent man. And what the problem that most people have is they go overboard one way or the other. They either go overboard and say Jesus is all man and no God, or like uh, there's a fallacy of perhaps like the Jehovah's Witnesses like to do. They quote verses that would seem to show that he's 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 not God but just a man. And, but they completely leave out the verses that show that Jesus is God. And then you got the other group on the other end that are equally heretical that say Jesus is all God but no man. But if you'll just read Philippians 2 starting in verse 5 or 6 and reading through the rest of that chapter you'll see that Jesus was complete man, complete God. He laid down his divine attributes as a man during those 30 odd years he was on the earth. He didn't exercise his sovereign uh, divine attributes. Uh, you know he could have summoned 12 legions of angels if he wanted to to rescue him from the cross and uh, you know he didn't he decided not to exercise his omnipotence his omniscience while he's a man yet and instead completely dependent on the father and the spirit uh, so uh, hopefully that'll clarify that I want to go into uh, a, a few more verses here on who Jesus is and we'll go into uh, uh, the resurrection and then we'll get into the Trinity itself and what the scriptures have to say about it and whether it's biblical or not. Now, a lot of people say, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but uh, just because the word isn't in the Bible doesn't mean that the concept of the Trinity isn't taught in the Bible. You know, there's a, a lot of words that aren't uh, in the Bible, but yet, you know, we, they, the concept is, is taught there. So we will see if the Bible teaches it or not. But what I want to look at right now is Titus 2.13, if I can find it here. And flipping over to Titus 2.13, uh, we see uh, a verse here, and it reads, Looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So right there in uh, Titus 2.13, we see that Jesus is called the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, some people try to break that in two uh, and say the great God and then Jesus, our Savior, being a separate entity. But uh, the Greek there uh, if, uh, won't, will not allow that to be to transpire. Uh, according to the Greek Granville Sharp rule, I know it sounds kind of technical, but sometimes you have to get technical to get your point across. The Granville Sharp rule in Greek uh, will not allow the, the division to take place there. When it says the great God... That is in direct conjunction and link to and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, the great God is applied to Jesus Christ because of the Granville Sharp rule in Greek, which states when a Greek chi and, that's the connective uh, word here, and, the great God and, so in the Greek and is translated chi, uh, connects the nouns, the nouns being uh, great uh, God and Savior, uh, Next, the nouns of the same case, if the article precedes the first noun and is not repeated before the second noun, the latter always refers to the, second, the same person that is uh, expressed or described by the first noun. So since, uh, since this falls directly into how you translate uh, the Greek text of the Bible into English, this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the great God and our Savior. Okay, and other passages, uh, Colossians. 2.9, Colossians 2.9 is another good verse that uh, uh, proves, proves that Jesus is God, God in the flesh, second person of the Trinity. Uh, looking at that verse, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, and uh, going down here I see in verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay. That that uh, that tells us right there that in Christ, and uh, if you read the context of the entire passage there, we know that when it says in Him, it's talking about Jesus Christ, uh, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, it, the completeness of God is all there in Jesus Christ, embodied in Jesus Christ. Uh, the Greek once again makes it very clear. And since I don't want to bore you too much with Greek and Greek rules and stuff like that, I won't. So, uh, knowing that that passage, uh, let's take a look at uh, like Romans 9:5. Uh, is another nice little passage. Romans chapter 9. I think it's Romans 9. D D D. Yes, Romans chapter 9, verse 5. And if you've got it there, it reads, Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God, blessed forever. Amen. So, it's calling Christ right there, God, blessed forever. Amen. How it's fairly obvious to me. And uh, one more here, I guess, uh, although I could just go infinitely, I, I suppose. There's so many scriptures, it, but... As usual, time creeps up on us, so let's take a look at the first chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, I want to uh, I'll just set this down. I'm going to take a look at a couple of things here and then uh, go on from there. Hebrews chapter 1, we're take, starting in verse, uh, let's start, start in verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And... Uh, Reading it says, Who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power that he had by himself purged our sins, sat down in the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Okay, he is by inheritance better than the angels. Although we read in other, there's other passages that say he was made a little lower than the angels to the suffering of death because while he was a man, he was a little lower than the angels. That's where we get back to him uh, not exercising his divine attributes. Okay? So, uh, 
We have here where it says, who being the, in verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, this in the Greek is, is very interesting. Uh, and uh, in better translation, I guess in, in more American English might say, it would translate like, uh, uh, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Whose nature? God's nature. And upholds all things by the word of his power. And this, this passage here from the Greek, uh, due to the Greek words of stasios and uh, in correlation with like what we've already seen in, in uh, Colossians 2.9, uh, cannot be interpreted any other way. Uh, the passage uh, of Scripture, I uh, believe, clarifies beyond doubt the deity of Jesus Christ. It would be illogical and unreasonable to suppose that Christ, who is the image imprinted by Jehovah's substance, is not of the substance of Jehovah, and hence God, or the second person of the triune deity. Uh, so he's of the very substance of God himself. And that will get us back into what we're going to talk about some more. Now, if you stay in that chapter, just look down in verse 6. Uh, we see in verse 6 there, Hebrews chapter 1, it says, And again, when he bring, bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. Now, uh, the first begotten, of course, is always understood and is Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, God, this is uh, in context, meaning Jehovah God, uh, God Almighty, saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. Worship who? Worship Jesus is what it means. Now that's very interesting when you consider that when you know that in Revelation 22, 8 and 9, uh, in Matthew 4, 9 and 10, and Luke 4, 7 and 8, Jesus, especially in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, Jesus said, uh, worship only God and serve only Him. And in Revelation 22, the angel told uh, uh, John, don't, don't worship Him, uh, the angel that is, worship God. And right here we have God Almighty telling, saying that all his angels should worship Jesus. Now, that's pretty interesting when you're told directly in one place that Jesus, is, Jesus says you're only to worship God. And then over here in Hebrews 1.6, God says to worship Jesus. Now, either Jesus is God or somebody's a little confused. And probably half of you out there are saying I am, but... Let me assure you from the scripture, uh, this starts to become very, very clear. Now, as we see here, if you'll just scan down past verse 7 to verse 8. Now, if I haven't shown you enough evidence from verse 3 and verse 6, look at verse 8. And it says, but unto the Son. Now, this is quoting, uh, this is uh, coming out of, uh, I think, Psalm 102, verses 24 through 27. It says, But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, who? Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. And uh, so we have here where God himself, and this is taken from an Old Testament quotation out of the Psalms, God himself is saying unto the Son. See there at the first of verse 8 there? But unto the Son... He saith, who's saying it? God is saying it. Unto the Son, God says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. So right there, you have God Almighty saying that Jesus is God. So uh, I hope uh, the point is getting fairly clear by this point. Uh, also, uh, just in quick reference uh, I, uh, I won't have the time to really look them all up but I'll, I'll just give you some uh, ready references uh, to, uh, to check these things uh, we know and uh, Jesus has given many titles throughout the New Testament and some of his titles are uh, he's called a creator he created all things in fact uh, I guess uh, well, I guess I better show you that passage just because maybe there's a lot of you that, don't, that didn't believe that Jesus is the creator of everything. But he is, and that's just another evidence for Jesus being God Almighty in the flesh, second person of the Trinity. Uh, let me take you back to Colossians here. 
And then I'll come back to these, re these quick references. I, I, I really do need to stress this point because it's, it's pretty important. We need to understand that Jesus is the creator. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and following. Okay, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and following. And of course, I'm reading from a King James. Uh, it's a good translation, although... Uh, I, I also recommend a new international version and uh, a new American standard version as good up-to-date English uh, translations with all the Greek scholarship and Hebrew scholarship you could possibly need. But now in Colossians 1.15, we read, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in our that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, excuse me, uh, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now the him here, of course, in context is the rest of the passage here, is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of every creature. And he, uh, for by him were all things created. Jesus created all things. Now, a lot of these religious cults try to say that the firstborn there shows that Jesus was born first, but that's not what the Greek says. The, the, the Greek was written in uh, uh, prototokos, meaning it didn't mean literally born as uh, a child is born to a mother. Uh, it, it indicates uh, uh, a title, a position, a, a, a preeminent position. And I'll stress that in a moment. And you, you find throughout the scriptures, uh, King David was called a firstborn uh, in Isaiah 89, 27. Uh, although we know he was the youngest of like seven brothers, but he's still called a firstborn. We know from Genesis 41, 51, uh, that uh, in following that uh, Manasseh and Ephraim were born. And Manasseh was born before Ephraim. And yet in Jeremiah 31, 9, Ephraim is declared to be the firstborn, even though we saw in Genesis 41:51 that uh, Manasseh was the uh, one literally first one born. But what we find here is this is a title. Even the Old Testament Hebrews in the rabbinical order is called Jehovah God, the firstborn of creation. So anyway, this word firstborn is even declaring that Jesus is God. And then it says in verse 16 that he created all things in heaven, earth, visible, invisible, principalities, powers, they were all created for Jesus and by him. So the whole creation is, was made by Jesus and everything was made for Jesus. Now, if that's not saying he's God, then uh, I guess God, if, if God did create him like some of these religions say, then God's sure not getting much out of the situation. He created a being and then let everything worship the creation rather than God himself. We know that's not true, though, because the Bible says God is a jealous God. He desires our love and devotion and worship. But anyway, as we see in verse 17, and he is before all things, is talking about Jesus, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that is, in all things he might have the preeminence. So we see that word firstborn there again from the dead. We know it could mean literally the first one raised from the dead because we know Jesus raised Lazarus. So Jesus, Lazarus was raised before Jesus was. So we know that firstborn doesn't mean uh, literally the first one you know, like born first, like some religions would say. But it's saying there is he's a preeminent one. He has the position, the power. He's got the title. He's overall. And uh, there's many other scriptures that prove this. But I wanted to show this passage to, to show that Jesus is a creator. He is God. He created everything. Now, to finish up my topical discussion here on, on this subject and move on to the resurrection of Christ, which is also critical in in achieving who, knowing who Jesus is and, and, achieve, and knowing the true and living God and salvation, we find in uh, uh, going back to just other references to who Jesus is, and I'll just mention these briefly, and uh, you can look them up at your leisure. Uh, I just mentioned the Creator. We know uh, from Colossians 1, 16 and following, which we just looked up, Hebrews 1, 10, and John 1, 3, and other passages, Jesus is the Creator. But we find in the Old Testament that God is the Creator. Uh, we see that in the New Testament, Jesus is called a Savior. 
But in the Old Testament, God is called a Savior, like Isaiah 45, 21 through 23. Uh, God is called a Savior. Uh, but Jesus is called a Savior. We see that Jesus is called a King in the, Old, in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God is called a King. Jesus is called a Judge in the New Testament. God is called a Judge in the Old Testament. Jesus claims the I Am for Himself. God is the I Am. Uh, Jesus is called the Rock. And in the Old Testament, God is called a rock. And like I say, I'll just, if you need the scripture references for these things I'm mentioning, just write us a note or give us a call and we'll send the references to you. Uh, in, a, in the New Testament, Jesus is called a shepherd. In the Old Testament, God is called a shepherd. In the New Testament, Jesus is called a light. In the Old Testament, God is called a light. In the New Testament, Jesus is called the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. In the, in the uh, Old Testament, God is called the first and the last. You know, uh, Jesus is getting all the same titles. Uh, Jesus is called the King of King and the Lord of Lord in the uh, New Testament. In the Old Testament, God is called uh, the, the King of Kings and the God of Gods, I believe. So uh, you find all these things. Uh, Jesus is worshipped by men and angels throughout the New Testament. You find people worshipping Jesus in Matthew 15 and Matthew 14. Look it up for yourself. Uh, and Jesus didn't rebuke them when he was worshipped by people and by angels. So uh, Jesus can forgive sin. And we find in the Old Testament only God can forgive sin. But yet Jesus can do the same. Uh, and on and on we could go. The scriptures are there. What I'd like to do now, having established the fact that Jesus is God Almighty, that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, that Jesus had a literal, physical resurrection from the dead. Now, many religious groups say that Jesus didn't raise physically from the dead, that he, uh, that he uh, died and then just ceased to exist and was recreated or something. So, what I'd like to do is... Uh, Go into the resurrection passages. We already touched on John chapter 20, verse 28, showing that Jesus appeared to the doubting Thomas and showed him his hands and his feet and uh, his side. Thomas believed and immediately declared him to be Lord and God. Uh, Jesus was literally physically there. Uh, and to further prove that, I want us to look at the Gospel of John chapter 2. Go to the Gospel of John, chapter 2, and let me see if I can find the verse here. John, chapter 2. Uh, and, uh, oh, here we go. John, chapter 2, verse 19. John, chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus is talking with the Jews and so forth, having a discussion out there. And uh, in verse 19, we read, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. He spake of the temple of his body. In three days he would raise it up. What's Jesus going to raise up? He's going to raise up his body. Not talk about spirit or anything here. The Greek word there for body is soma. And soma always refers to uh, a physical body and, uh, you know, uh, not a spirit, a physical resurrection. So he's going to raise up his body. In his own words, right there, Jesus said it. Now, when we take that in cross-reference to other passages, uh, we'll get a clear understanding of the resurrection of Christ and how he did raise from the dead. He rose in his own body, and we get this in Luke chapter 24. So go on over to the Gospel of Luke, tail end of Luke chapter 24, and uh, we'll look at... Uh, well, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll mention verse 7, but I want to look at something even further down. It says, verse 7, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. So this is what Jesus is prophesying ahead of time, uh, or, or well, after, after the fact. Uh, this is what the uh, angel said at the, at the tomb. 
Uh, he is not here, but he is risen. This is verse 6. Uh, he is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. So the angel in the tomb declares that Jesus is going to rise again. Okay? And now we're going to see something uh, through this, through this uh, entire chapter here, chapter 24. Jesus is going to make his appearance in his resurrected body. As we've already seen in, in John chapter 2, he's going to raise his body. Okay, now let's uh, look down through here. All this is I, your homework assignment is to read the entire chapter of uh, Luke chapter 24, but uh, I want to start in verse uh, 36. Let's start in Luke chapter 4, verse 36, and we're going to see some interesting things here. Now, I know a lot of people, while we're getting ready to look there, say Jesus had to be a spirit because people couldn't recognize him and he suddenly appeared in a room while the doors were shut and things. But, you know, it says in verse 16 of this chapter that their eyes were holding. God, by a sovereign act, can keep you from seeing something if he wants to see you. After all, God is almighty. He can accomplish and do whatsoever he wants to. As uh, I think it's Daniel chapter 24 and numerous other passages so clearly state. So uh, Jesus, uh, when they couldn't recognize him, their eyes were holding by a sovereign act of God. And uh, in his resurrected body, which wasn't completely like our body, it was a glorified body that we will also have. Because in First uh, John chapter 3, verse 2, it says, When he shall appear, we shall be like him. Now, if he's, uh, when resurrection day comes, we shall be like Jesus. We are to have our own bodies on this, uh, resurrected bodies, uh, not just spirits. And uh, I don't think anyone would disagree that in the next life we will have bodies, but not just spirits. Uh, but anyway, that's something else. Let me start in verse 36 and uh, go on from there. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now see, they mainly make the, the mistake we're trying to eliminate here. They supposed that they saw a spirit when they saw Jesus' appearance there. They, they saw him and they thought, oh, he's a ghost, he's a spirit. And a lot of these religious cults say the same thing. But we see here that they supposed that they had seen a ghost, but now Jesus talks to them and clears up the, the whole matter. Verse 38. And he saith unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. There's the, there it is from the very mouth of the Son of God, the Savior of the world. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they, were, while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. Once again, this proves that Jesus had a, a physical form, not just a spirit, because spirits don't need to eat food. And Jesus wanted to prove once again not only from his physical hands and feet, but then to actually sit down and, and sup with them. And, uh, and of course, uh, verse 44, just to conclude this little section here, uh, it says, And he thus said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So, uh, uh, we saw that Jesus had earlier prophesied in John chapter 2 uh, about he was going to raise his body himself on the third day. Just like Jonah was in a whale for three days. We find other scriptures pertaining to that. So anyway, uh, this shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus raised in his own body, not a spirit. Okay. With this established, I want to just show you the crucial nature of this. A lot of people think, oh, well, it's not so important that I believe that. I mean, it may be true from what I see here, but uh, is that really so essential to, uh, to uh, everything? Uh, well, it is because you must believe that Jesus was raised up 
not just as a spirit creature, but uh, in his own body. And uh, was raised physically. Okay, and uh, I, I wanted to show you one thing here as I get into this. Uh, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1, and just moving throughout the chapter, I guess. We're going to be looking at several verses from this chapter, but you'll see the critical nature of believing in the resurrection of Christ as it's taught by Holy Scripture. Uh, we'll see here in first, uh, first of all, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and following, that the actual gospel of Christ. A lot of people say, I'm preaching the gospel, and you ask, well, what is the gospel? And then they can't tell you. It's uh, it's sort of like a guy that comes up to your door and he says, uh, I'm selling apples today. He says, well, uh, where are they? I'd like to buy some. Then he tells you he doesn't have any. <laughs> uh, you know, the gospel is presented right here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, it says, reading from verse 1 on, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Uh, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. There's your gospel right there. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So your gospel is right there. Okay, now moving down the page, uh, we see down here in verse uh, 12. Let's look down at uh, verse 12 and then we'll just kind of move through the chapter because there's a lot of important stuff here. Look at verse 12 and it says, now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then, it is, our, then, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is vain also. Or, as it literally says, and your faith is also vain. And then looking, uh, reading on, it says in verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your, vain, your, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins, uh, they, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable to be pitied, literally from the Greek. Uh, but now he clarifies. See, he's saying now if Christ is not raised and not raised in his own body, because we're looking for that glorious coming and to, to be resurrected also with Christ and to be like him, as 1 John 3, 2 says. And we know from the other resurrection scriptures, uh, uh, Matthew 25, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, and so forth. Uh, we see these verses that, uh, are very critical. We must believe he was raised, raised in his own body, because we're going to be like him in the, in the in next life. And uh, the apostle Paul says, well, he is raised, because in verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And uh, uh, verse 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ uh, shall all be made alive. And uh, it goes on from there. So this is another great chapter to read. Uh, it'll explain many, many things to you. Now, there's a lot of perversions that are brought in here also uh, from other religious groups that would uh, pervert some of these things that are expounded here. But the key here is, uh, and it gets into the resurrection of the body over there in the latter part of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As my time is starting to draw to a close, uh, I have to kind of hurry along here, but the latter verses, particularly like uh, verses uh, 41 and following, uh, or 40 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, talk about uh, 
the physical resurrection and things of this nature, but it's critical. Okay. It is critical to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's critical to believe that he was God, God in the flesh, as we've gone through many scriptures to prove that. The last thing, I, and I've only got a few minutes, unfortunately, because uh, these kind of doctrines weren't meant just to be preached in a short amount of time, but... Uh, if you have questions, please write us or call us. Uh, I will get now, in the time I have left, into the Trinity and the teaching of the Trinity. And the verse, first verse I'd like to look at there briefly is uh, Matthew chapter 24, or uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. So, going over here in the New Testament, first gospel, towards the back end of it, we uh, we take a look. At Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, and it says, this is spoken by Jesus, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So, we have there the Holy Trinity when you're baptized, you're to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, you notice the name is not plural there. It's singular, indicating a singular uh, entity, but in the form of three persons. Now, I want to, at this point, before I go on, just read you one of the uh, great uh, confirmations of the Trinity, uh, the Athanasian Creed, and uh, it'll give you some idea of what the Trinity is and in, in uh, by definition a simple definition and most correct I think is within the nature of the one God there are three eternally distinct persons okay these aren't three gods within one these are three eternally distinct persons within the nature of the one God they all share the same attributes and divine essence of divinity okay just reading this uh, this definition of Trinity we worship one God and Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such as the Son is, and such as the Holy Ghost. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Ghost is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. And in this trinity, none is before or after other. Uh, none is greater or less than, than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal together, and co-equal, so that in all things, as is aforesaid, the unity is trinity, and the trinity is unity, is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that is to be saved, must think of the trinity. That's, that's the Athanasian Creed. And uh, I know I've only got a few, uh, few minutes now, and uh, uh, I, I think I've thoroughly established that Jesus Christ is God, We've seen the, the Trinity mentioned there in the Scripture. There's many more. I don't have time to go into them. What I will do briefly in a few moments I have left is show you that the Holy Spirit is God also. There is one God, the Bible declares. The Father is God. No one hardly disputes that. Jesus is God. We've shown that. And now we're going to simply show that the, the, that the Holy Spirit is God, and He is the third person of the Trinity. Now, uh, turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, I'm going to have to kind of race through this in the time I've got left. Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1 and reading through verse 4. Okay? Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And reading from verse 1, it says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and bought a certain part and laid it at the and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Uh, while it remained, uh, was it not thine own? 
And uh, after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Okay, you see there, uh, they have lied to the Holy Ghost and then in verse 3, and then in verse 4, he says, You haven't lied to men, but to God. So he equates the Holy Ghost with God. Okay? Uh, there are uh, numerous other uh, passages I wish I had more time to, to go into. We know that uh, the Holy Ghost has a personality. I think it's Acts chapter 13, verse 2. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. Yes, it's right here. Uh, it says... As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work hereunto I have called them. Okay, the Holy Ghost has a personality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, the Holy Ghost determines the spiritual gifts you get, speaking in tongues, prophecy, those things. Uh, throughout the scriptures, we find the Holy Ghost uh, is given divine attributes, has a personality, even though this is denied by many religious uh, institutions and religion, religions, uh, cults. Uh, but just to briefly tell you, uh, please look up the verses like uh, on the Holy Spirit being God, like uh, John 14:16. Uh, uh, John 15:26. We already looked at Acts 13:2. Uh, we see other scriptures throughout that uh, talk about uh, the Holy Ghost uh, and governs gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and other things. But uh, if you have more questions about the Trinity, the Holy Ghost being God, which is easily provable, uh, write Day Spring Evangelism, Post Office Box 43331, Austin, Texas 78745. Thank you so much for putting up with me here as we kind of race through the scriptures to get on some key points. But the thing to remember is Jesus Christ is God Almighty, second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He raised from the dead on the third day, and you must believe in this Jesus to be saved. God bless you, and may the Lord direct all your steps. Amen. Please contact Christian Answers. For free information on numerous subjects, important subjects, such as the biblical doctrine of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Free newsletters are available on the heretical position held by many unbiblical cults, such as Jehovah's Witnesses and the Oneness Pentecostals who deny the Trinity. Free newsletters are available on strange groups, such as the King James Onlyites. To receive your free information, please call 512-218-8022 or email us at cdebater at aol.com. To see full-length videos on these and other subjects, go to Yahoo Video, type Larry Wessels into the search box, and click on the icon for iShoot Video or iShoot Video 2.